I'm, I'm currently Executive Director of Gender Rights Maryland. I'm a retired eye physician and surgeon. I'm a mother of two sons, 27 and 24. I grew up in New York, as you did. Uh, went to high school in the Bronx, then Cornell University, the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. I trained at the Bascom Palmer Eye Institute, worked abroad in Kenya and Nepal, then had my practice in, in southern Mississippi, retired then due to a, a trauma that I had suffered as a child, and after transition, I became active in the LGBT community. I basically, outside of my role as the Executive Director of Gender Rights Maryland, which is to improve the, the lives of trans people in Maryland, and in Maryland, we have already covered 95% of trans people with county anti-discrimination laws in Montgomery County, Howard County, Baltimore County, and the city of Baltimore. Um, more importantly, though, the goal is to, for me on a personal level, is to create a world where children can grow up and be themselves and not have to hide the way I did back in the 20th century. So everything I do is focused on that, be it on the local, the state, or the federal level. Well, until very recently, it was very difficult for trans voices to be heard. We were originally part of the gay rights movement going back to the Stonewall Uprising in 1969 in New York, when the rumor has it that it was a trans woman, Sylvia Rivera, who threw the first high heel at the police and, and started the, the uprising. I happened to be down in the village that weekend, though I was very deeply closeted at the time. The movement was taken over by gay men for the most part. They alienated a lot of the trans community at the time who were a little bit too gender non-conforming. Women were also pushed out of any leadership position and it wasn't until the AIDS epidemic that women began to come into the movement and then in the 90s that, that trans persons, primarily women, but more and more men as the years went by, began to express their own opinions and their own feelings and to push back to make it the LGBT community that it is today. Well, there are very few of those stories. There have been a couple of very small city council victories. There was a mayor out in Oregon. That we have a, a, a judge out in Oakland, Alameda County now. We have an administrative judge, Phyllis Fry, who was one of the earliest trans activists out of Houston. She started the, the trans legal community back in the early 90s. But for the most part, and we've also had one school board member out in Hawaii, but for the most part, that's it. The Victory Fund is working now to try to increase the number of trans elected officials, or at least increase the number of trans candidates. I've run for office twice, both in 2006 and 2010, for the House of Delegates in the state of Maryland. But there is a, a growing need for trans representation, as our gay colleagues will always say. If you're not at the, on the, at the sitting at the table, then you're on the menu. And it's important that the world see that trans people are not the same as gay people, although many trans people are gay, and some gay people are trans, that we don't always have the same issues. Now, the past year has seen remarkable progress for the trans community, and I wouldn't even call it minimal. I mean, this past week, the vice president said that trans rights are the civil rights issue of our time. An absolutely stunning statement by Joe Biden, very characteristic of the vice president to say that, but the fact that the vice president of the United States said it is remarkable. But that is simply following up on the recognition that the trans community has received back at the Democratic National Convention. We were honored at the LGBT caucus. We raised over $100,000 for the Obama campaign. We had 14 delegates this year which was far more than the four we had three years earlier. We've made great strides in employment law. We are now covered under Title VII. We are covered in the federal contractor workspace under President Johnson's executive order of 1965. We are covered now in what is probably the most important issue for trans people, other than employment, we're covered now in health care so that any physician, any healthcare provider, any healthcare institution that receives federal funds of any, in any way, shape, or form, which is virtually everybody, I would imagine, cannot discriminate against trans people. 
Title IX covers trans people. Any place in the law where it says sex discrimination, trans people and gender nonconforming people in general, and there are far more non-trans gender nonconforming people than there are trans people, are covered now, protected against discrimination. Uh, the laws, the, the regulations to get passports have been, uh, have, been, have been cleaned up. You no longer need surgery in order to change your passport. That is the ultimate identity document. Uh, veterans' health care benefits have been, have been brought into the 21st century. There have been huge examples of progress in federal housing regulations and such. So on the federal level, beginning back in 2009, when the Office of Personnel Management included gender identity and expression in its regs to the passage of the Hate Crimes Act, which was trans-inclusive, but then through all these changes that have happened in, in virtually every agency of the federal government, and then with these blockbuster decisions out of the Title VII decision from the EEOC in, in past April, the 11th Circuit decision out of Atlanta last December, covering trans people under the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution. All of these are remarkable advances, landmark, historic. I, I still haven't wrapped my arms around the changes that have happened for our community. Well, I would give different advice to allies and LGBT youth as far as making trans equality a real lived experience. For LGBT youth, the most important thing is to be yourself. You come out, be yourself, don't let anybody tell you who you should be or who you are. Simply be yourself, stand up for yourself, develop the sense of self-worth, the sense of self-esteem that you need in order to, to, to make the change to have a fulfilling life. As far as our allies go, I would simply say that we are a part of this community. Not only do we deserve as your allies in the LGBT community our full civil rights, but you can also not only learn a lot from our experience, but benefit from our experience. The courts are using gender expression now as a way of expanding civil rights. This applies to far more gay persons than it does to trans persons. This is the way to full freedom and equality in this country. And once we get the recognition that sexual orientation is simply another variation of human sexuality in the federal courts, then we will all have equality. So we all stand to benefit from this. Even all those gender nonconforming straight and cisgender Americans who really aren't a part of our community, but who are also discriminated against and bullied and harassed, particularly children in school. Well, the medical community is one of the most conservative of, of professions. That may be hard to believe because they're always cutting edge treatments, you know, drug therapy, surgeries and stuff. But as an institution, medicine is, is, is very conservative. However, this past year, along with those blockbuster legal decisions, we have finally the depathologization of gender identity as a mental illness. We are no longer considered mentally ill having difficulty, it's called dysphoria, with one's trans state is now a condition, but it is simply another type of anxiety disorder which can be treated and then you move on. So you no longer have a mental illness which sticks with you for your entire life. By removing us from the category of mental illness, we basically defang the opposition's attempts to marginalize us in society. So now our civil rights are just like the civil rights of anybody else. It's a shame in America that we discriminate against people who have mental illness, and I am not, I do not want to imply in any way that it's okay now to discriminate against other people with mental illness, but you can't discriminate against trans people because they're no longer considered mentally ill. That's not the case at all. It's a disgrace to discriminate against anybody on that basis, period, for any medical condition, and we generally don't do that. But removing the stigma of mental illness from trans people is as important to the trans community as removing homosexuality from the DSM in 1973 was. That changed the trajectory, that changed the acceleration of the gay rights movement in 1973. There's a general consensus on that in the gay community. The same thing will happen with us. It took another 40 years, but we're finally there. And as a result, 
the attitude of the medical community as a whole, which has been changing in various localities. Again, all politics is local, and medicine is a broad profession in, with many different subspecialties. There's been a lot of change with this. We are educating the next generation of physicians to recognize the humanity of trans people and gay people as well. So this generation will not be educated the way I was to think of trans people as being mentally ill. It's generational change. It will take time. Most physicians now who cannot discriminate still know very little about who trans people are, so it will be incumbent upon us to educate them in order to get it right. But this is part of the dialectic of civil rights where we take two steps forward, one step back, we move up to a new level, and then we keep taking it forward from there. Each of us has a role to play. In all these different various fields, there are more and more psychologists and social workers who are interested in issues of gender variance in children. That's cutting edge now in this society. You see this on programs like Anderson Cooper, Cooper and, and Oprah back in the day when she had those programs of trans kids. Americans basically embrace trans children because they recognize the humanity there in those families. So we are making huge progress, and these kids are now getting the ability to live their lives fully from the earliest years, something that many of us never had. And we had to deal with the consequences of living in a world which was, for the most part, almost completely lacking in understanding of what the condition was. About.